A very uh, good morning and a warm welcome to everyone this morning. That praise be unto God who has given us another day uh, in this uh, uncertain, changing times. We thank God for giving us another privilege to sit in our respective homes and to meditate and to focus our attention on the word of God and the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God for the TRC ministry which has been benefiting many believers and uh, bringing many to ed for edification of the saints and the work of the ministry. And we thank God for the responsible brethren who have uh, shouldered this responsibility to teach God's word in a very systematic and in a very uh, manner which is, which is uh, reaching out in our respective homes in spite of the difficulties which we face. God has given us the privilege from God's servants from time to time to, to ponder upon various subjects and to be benefited uh, with the meditation of God's word. This morning, uh, we thank God for uh, bringing us his servant, Brother Paulson, who will be leading us with the study of the Paulson uh, Pauline epistles and who will, uh, as Apostle Paul labored he was an example you know uh, half of the new testament is uh, written by apostle paul and his labor he often quotes he says i it's not me but christ in me and the grace of god that i could accomplish uh, for the lord for the lord and uh, he was ready to serve the lord when he even on the road to damascus we see the transformation in his life so we thank god for uh, uh, Brother, Brother Paulson, in, uh, uh, who will be sharing from God's word. Before that, we will just uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Maybe bow our heads, close our eyes, and uh, come at this session in a word of prayer. Our God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this morning time that Thou hast given us. We thank Thee, Lord, for the our Creator, Sustainer, and Provider, the God in whom we can trust, the true and living God. We thank Thee, Father, for Thou art a God who is mindful of us, who loved us in everlasting love, who gave the only begotten Son, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into this world to save us from our sins, to redeem us from our lost conditions. We thank Thee that we are justified and we are, Lord, redeemed by the precious blood and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We thank Thee for the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, which our Lord paid on our behalf, through which we have forgiveness of sins. We thank Thee, Lord, the perfect, just demand of the for God was fulfilled as he became a propitiation for our sins, Lord. We thank this morning that we have a God who, uh, who uh, through the Lord, who loves us, who cares for us, who provides for us. And we thank this morning for providing for us, Lord, spiritual manna, spiritual food through thy servant, uh, Brother Paulson, Lord. We thank thee for helping each one of us to log in, pray for the internet connectivity that you may it may be stable, Lord. We pray for those who are yet to log in, that they may log in soon and be benefited, Lord. We thank thee for thy word, which, which helps us, Lord, to be edified, which helps us to examine and encourages our spiritual life in this world, Lord. We are living in times where we don't know what is going to happen next, Lord, and it's uncertain. But we know one thing, that thou art a faithful God, thou art a God who is in control, thou art a sovereign, a true and living God. And, and then we can trust in you because you are in control, you are on the throne, and you allow all things to pass according to your purpose, will, and plan. So we pray this uh, morning, our time, Lord, as we sit together with our, from our respective places, with one uh, aim, Lord, to listen from thy word, to be blessed, that we may not only be hearers, but also doers of thy word, Lord. We may live lives that are pleasing, acceptable, righteous in thy sight, and giving thee all glory. Lord, we pray for thy servant that thou may give me the unction from above that we may, Lord, be able to benefit from the study this morning, that thy word may be given with fullness, that it may be rightly divided, expounded for our, our edification, Lord, that we may be, Lord, thy servants, carrying out thy work as we have the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and of Apostle Paul, who labored and who, Lord, went through many persecutions, went through many trials, but still they remained firm in their faith, Lord, and they served you, Lord. We pray for the Apostle Paul and all the, uh, as we remember, Lord, here at our team, and Lord, we pray that you may help us, that you may help us in our ministry also to follow the example and help us to, Lord, 
uh, be help us to be fruitful in our Christian work, work Lord. We come at the time ahead. And we uh, thank thee for this ministry once again. We ask this prayer in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Paulson, over to you. Love greetings to you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We praise God that he enabled once again to uh, come together uh, before the word of God. Uh, we have been studying from the Pauline epistles. Uh, the epistles from Romans to Philemon are called the Pauline epistles, which were written by Apostle Paul. And we had decided a plan of our study uh, I shall just uh, remind you about that uh, plan uh, so that we will be able to uh, uh, understand where we are in our studies. Uh, after the first missionary journey, Paul wrote the epistle to Galatians. And during the second missionary journey, Apostle Paul wrote uh, first and second Thessalonians. So after the second missionary journey, two epistles. And then after the, during the third missionary journey, he wrote three epistles. That is first Corinthians, second Corinthians uh, and Romans. And then uh, he was imprisoned. During the imprisonment, uh, he wrote uh, four prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippia, Philippians, uh, Colossians and uh, Philemon. And then after that, uh, he was released from the prison. And during that period, he wrote uh, two epistles, that is 1 Timothy and Titus. And during his uh, second imprisonment, he wrote the second epistle to Timothy. Uh, these are the 13 Pauline epistles. We have completed our uh, study of the first missionary journey and then the overview of uh, epistle to Galatians. Now we are today going to study the second missionary journey. Uh, <clears throat> we, read, we read about the second missionary journey uh, from, uh, from Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to uh, chapter 18, verse 22. Uh, this is the portion that covers the uh, narration of a second missionary journey. In this study, today we will consider four major things. One is the route that was undertook by Paul and Silas uh, during their missionary journey. And then we will see some observations about the uh, second missionary journey. We find there are some differences and some uh, important things uh, in this uh, second missionary journey in comparison to the first missionary journey. We will make note of that. And then uh, we will go through the places where Paul visited and the major events. We can see a little detailed narration about um, the ministry in Philippi, uh, then uh, in Thessalonica, and then in Berea, in Athens, and in Corinth. These are the five major cities where we find some narration about the ministry that Paul accomplished. We will go through all of them very briefly in the limited time that we have. And then when we read this portion, there are many questions that come to our mind, such as uh, why there was a dissension between Paul and Barnabas, two very uh, able ministers and who were used of the Lord. And then uh, who was right in that dissension? And then there are questions such as, uh, why did the Lord restrict their movement when we were trying, when they were trying to go to Bithynia uh, or to Phrygia? What was the reason for that? And uh, how did the Lord do it? And then we find many, many such questions come to our mind. Then finally, we find that Paul uh, decided to go to Sencrea for a haircut. How a matured believer like Paul could do that, that kind of a thing. These are the questions that will come to our mind. So I'll raise those questions and I'll try to answer those questions. Um, if there are other questions coming to your mind, uh, the listeners, dear brothers and sisters, you can uh, point out and we'll try to find answer. So shall we uh, go through the map and understand the, uh, the journey that Paul undertook? Um, as we remembered, uh, each missionary journey starts at Syrian Antioch 
and then he returned to Syrian Antioch. Only in the third missionary journey, he could not return to Antioch before that uh, he was arrested. Now, uh, he started the second missionary journey, as you see in this map, uh, from Antioch. Now, um, from Antioch, he, uh, by land, he traveled to uh, Tarsus and then to, uh, then to uh, we find here, to Cilicia, uh, this region, Cilicia, and then from there to uh, Derby. Uh, Derby, we know in the first missionary journey, he had uh, traveled through Derby, ministered there, and then to Lystra, and then from there, he went on to Iconium. These were the places where he had ministered during the first missionary journey. And also the Pisidian, Pisidian Antioch. Uh, so these are the places where he uh, traveled uh, during the second missionary journey. And then we find that his plan was to go towards the north or the south of the uh, Antioch, Pisidian Antioch. That was his purpose. Um, and then uh, we find that the Holy Spirit stopped from uh, going to Phrygia and also to uh, Bithynia, which is on the, uh, on the north side of uh, Antioch, Pisidian Antioch. He could not go there also. And then we find that he traveled to Mysia and Mysia and from Mysia, he went to Troas. Now in Troas, he had a, uh, he had a dream in which now, a Macedonian person uh, came to him and uh, asking him to help. So this he understood that uh, the Lord's guidance to, uh, to come to Europe. So thus from Troas, they decided to travel towards Europe. Now we find that from Troas, they went to uh, Samothrace and from Samothrace, they traveled to, uh, travel to Neapolis. And from Neapolis, they traveled to Philippi. Now, Philippi was a commercial center and a, a Roman uh, colony. So uh, he ministered there. Uh, he was there for, we can assume, for a few months he was there. And we find that uh, Luke joined him uh, from Troas. Uh, and it is told that there was a medical school in Philippi. So probably Luke must have learned that. This is only an assumption, a speculation. We don't know. Uh, anyway, he probably, Luke continued in ministry in Philippi, and from there, uh, he traveled to Amphipolis, and from Amphipolis, he went to Apollonia. Now, in these places, we do not read about any details of ministry, so from Apollonia, then he went to Thessalonica, and we find that Thessalonica, there was a ministry, and uh, he was there for a few months. Uh, during those few months, there was a uh, good uh, response from the Jews as well as uh, Greeks, and there were many believers. But what happened is uh, he was forced to leave that place. So within a few months, uh, he had to, we could, we could say maybe two, two to three months he was there in ministry, and after that he had to leave that place. And uh, then they went to Beria, and in Beria also he could be there only for probably a few days. Uh, then again, there was persecution and he had to leave Berea. And from Berea, he went to Athens. And in Athens, he was alone there ministering. He was there for some time. And then from Athens, uh, the Lord must have led him to go to Corinth. Now, uh, Corinth, he was there for uh, more than one and a half years. And he ministered. There was a church was established. And from Corinth, he went to St. Crea. And from St. Crea, uh, he went to Ephesus, and from Ephesus, uh, he traveled uh, to Caesarea, and from Caesarea, he went to uh, Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, he went to Antioch. And this is how the journey he undertook uh, the, during the second missionary journey. Now, I would like to mention who all was there with Paul during this, uh, his journey. He started along with Silas from Antioch. And uh, at uh, Lystra, uh, Timothy joined him. And so uh, Timothy, Silas, and Paul together went to Troas. And from Troas, when he reached at Philippi, uh, we find that from Troas, Luke also joined him. So Luke, 
uh, Paul, Timothy, Silas. These four men came to uh, Philippi. From Philippi, uh, they, we find that Luke uh, stayed on in Philippi, most probably. We did not find that uh, any narration about that, but most probably because uh, from 17 onwards, we don't find mention of Luke uh, along with them. And then we find in uh, Thessalonica, uh, Silas, Timothy, and Paul. These three men were there in Thessalonica. From Thessalonica, when they went to Berea, all three of them were there. But from Berea, Paul alone went to Athens. And from Athens, Paul alone went to Corinth. And in Corinth, uh, Priscilla and Aquila joined Paul. And from uh, and Corinth, Paul was waiting for uh, Silas and Timothy to join him. Uh, they joined him and they were together for some time. And after that, we find that uh, Aquila, Priscilla and Paul, they together traveled to Ephesus. And from Ephesus, Paul alone went to uh, Caesarea. And from Caesarea to Jerusalem, Paul went alone. And then Paul went alone to uh, Antioch. This is the uh, you know, the, the summary of the second missionary journey. Now, shall we uh, look at the uh, details uh, of this journey? Now, some of the things which we find very interesting is, in the first missionary journey, the conflict was mainly with the Jews. And we find that Jews were instigating others to oppose and persecute Paul. But in the second missionary journey, we find that there were many instances the conflict went to the level of the local government authority. And this is something very significant because now Paul's ministry, the Lord's work has come into the sight of the rulers and the rulers are taking action against uh, what Paul is doing. Now, this is what something that we can uh, notice. We find that um, when Paul was at uh, Philippi, uh, we find that uh, they uh, drew him to the, uh, the magistrates uh, who were the rulers appointed by the Roman government. Uh, he was uh, taken there. Uh, we find that in uh, chapter 16, verse 20, and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and, reach, uh, and teach customs uh, which are not lawful for us to receive neither to observe being Romans. This was the allegation, uh, accusation against uh, Paul and Silas, and uh, they were brought to magistrates. And then when we come to uh, chapter 17, verse 6, where we find that there were Roman rulers appointed, and they were brought to them, chapter 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down, are come hither also. Again, we find in Thessalonica, they were taken to the rulers. And then also in chapter 17 at Athens, again, uh, he was called to Areopagus. Uh, it was on the Mars Hills, like a Supreme Court. There, there was no trial uh, Paul had to undergo, but we find that there was, uh, he was given an opportunity to explain his faith. So that was another occasion where he had to directly deal with the magistrates or the, or the rulers of that uh, uh, and Athens, city of Athens. And then when we come to Corinth, again, we find that uh, the Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, uh, he, they, he was brought in front of uh, uh, Gallio, but he could not or explain to him anything before that uh, he dismissed the uh, hearing. So therefore, uh, but he was brought into the notice of Gallio. So this is one thing we find in the second missionary journey that uh, there were instances where Paul had to Interact or count encounter the rulers of the uh, of the cities. Now another thing, what we find is the writer Luke is personally joining in this uh, ministry. So therefore, there is a first-hand eyewitness recording the things that he saw. That is something significant about uh, Paul's uh, the second missionary journey. Uh, we can recognize this by the change of the pronoun from they to we. In uh, chapter 16, verse 10, we find, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, uh, assuredly gathering uh, that the Lord had called us for the 
uh, to for to preach the gospel unto them so here we find and when we come to chapter 17 verse 1 again we read now when they had passed through amphipolis and apollonia they came to thessalonica where was a synagogue of the jews now we find uh, that um, we know that the philippian church had to undergo persecution probably the presence of luke and luke's ministry was beneficial to strengthen the church at the philippi that is something encouraging encouraging for us to note though not directly reported by uh, luke in the in the acts book of acts now the next thing what we read is uh, we find that instances where believers accommodating the ministers uh, in their uh, homes this is something that has continued ever since and uh, commended by the apostles in the epistles and instructed by the apostles in the epistles and also practiced by the believers in the book of acts and also appreciated by the lord in the gospels so this is something very exemplary there is definitely a great reward for those who Uh, contribute in the ministry in this manner accommodating the mission ministries in their homes and then another thing that we find is the interplay of preachers action and inaction and god's uh, action and inaction resulting in progress of work as god planned this is something that's very interesting for instance i'll just tell you one thing now Uh, paul was a roman citizen he had the right to resist any kind of uh, persecution with, with without trial when he was at philippi but we find that he did not mention about it anything on the first day but after he was released from the prison he uh, brought that right before the magistrates and he wanted them to come and uh, release them now uh, if he would have told the same thing on the previous day the jailer would not have been saved i mean in humanly speaking but we find god so permitted that he did not claim that right on the previous day but on the next day it happened now this is something very interesting that we find the the interplay of action and inaction of the missionaries and the action and inaction of god Uh, and resulting in the progress of ministry this is very important for us to note because this is true even today even today in the work of the lord god has his own way of doing things and not doing things and believers they need to be guided by the lord in their action and in action and being filled and controlled by the holy spirit when the work is done the work will progress this is something uh, interesting for us to notice now the f- finally one observation that i want to make is god's clear guidance and intervention in the movement of preachers this is something very interesting they wanted to go to the north of uh, uh, north of asia minor uh, bithynia or to the south in phrygia but we find that the lord restricted their path the purpose of god was that they should go to europe this was the right opportunity that god had set for them to go to europe and to preach in europe and god ensured that by guiding them in this manner and uh, we find that the holy spirit restricted their path uh, to towards bithynia and phrygia and they had to move in the direction of uh, going to europe so this is something that we find so see, there are five things which uh, we notice in the ministry uh, during the second missionary i'll just repeat once again um conflict with lo- local authorities and rulers and magistrates even today we can see that conflicts are always uh, brought by the opponents to the level of um, disobeying the law disregarding the law and that is how believers and the evangelists are being persecuted and this is a strategy that satan has adopted right from those days and the second thing luke joining the missionaries troas and probably staying back in philippi and then the third thing is believers accommodating servants of god at their homes i would like to encourage every brother and sister who are listening to me make this your commitment i remember one instance when one sister told uh, that uh, her husband was complaining to me that uh, my wife takes a lot of trouble when she has to accommodate servants of god then in response to that that sister told me that i every time think if i miss this chance i may not get another opportunity to give uh, to uh, to minister to the servants of god 
this would be the attitude of believers in accommodating uh, servants of God in our homes. And then the fourth thing is the interplay of preachers action in action and God's action in action resulting in the progress of work as God planned. And the fifth uh, thing is God's intervention and guidance in the movement of missionaries. And we need to understand that we should always seek God's will with regard to the work and we should progress as God guides and that's what would make uh, progress in the work. Now, I'll we look briefly uh, at the ministry that was done at Philippi. We read the uh, narration uh, in chapter 16, verse uh, 11 onwards till verse 40. Uh, we, uh, we find that when they reached there, they came in contact with some Jewish women. Uh, normally, if there are more than 10 families, uh, the Jews would try to establish a synagogue. But in Philippi, there were no so many families, Jewish families. So we find that there were women who were coming to the riverside to pray. So we find that uh, these evangelists, they went to the riverside and met these women and they preached the gospel to them. And when they shared the gospel, we find a woman by name Lydia, who was uh, marketing purple fiber uh, in uh, Philippi. Uh, she is originally from Thyatira. Uh, she, and, uh, she came in contact with the uh, evangelist and the Lord opened her heart and she, she accepted the Lord along with her household. So probably uh, if she was a spinster, those who are working with her were staying with her. So that is what is referred by household. And so she and her household uh, believed in the Lord and they were baptized. This was the uh, first uh, first uh, believer. She was the first believer in Europe, and that's how the ministry started in Philippi. And then, when we uh, then we find that there was a, a young girl uh, who was uh, possessed by an evil spirit, and she was uh, proclaiming that uh, uh, Paul and uh, Silas uh, they are the uh, servants of uh, born servants of uh, Most High God, and when uh, this, this, this lady was, uh, this girl was doing this uh, continuously for many days. Uh, Paul was grieved in his heart and then Paul rebuked the evil spirit in this uh, girl. And as a result, what happened is she used to do the fortune telling and, uh, and she used to make a lot of uh, money ma for her masters. And these masters were disturbed when this evil spirit uh, went out of this uh, girl. And as a result, we find that they decided to drag this evangelist, uh, the preachers to the magistrates. And uh, they were beaten and uh, the magistrates tore their clothes and uh, they were wounded and they were uh, asked to be imprisoned securely. And we find that uh, they were in the prison. And while they were in the prison, they sang and they praised God. And uh, this is something unusual. When they are suffering pain and they are being insulted, we find that these evangelists, these preachers are singing and praising God. And what happened is after some time, there was an earthquake. And after the earthquake, uh, the prisoner was sleeping. The prisoner woke up and he found that uh, all the doors are open, all the locks have gone. Now what will happen is the prisoners would escape and there was no light. So the prisoner thought he will kill himself because he's responsible to securely guarding all the prisoners, especially Paul and Silas. And when this was happening, Paul immediately told that, why are you doing harm to yourself? Don't kill yourself, we all are here. And then we do not know what actually caused this uh, Philippian uh, jailer to ask uh, as to uh, how the, he can be saved, whether he was thinking of uh, saving from this the punishment that would come upon him or what he had in his mind, we do not know. But when we find that Paul answered him that he should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he would be saved. And as a result, we find that this jailer believed and he was saved and his household also believed and they were saved. And subsequently, uh, Paul was taken into their house and he, they treated him well and their wounds were wound and then uh, bound and then uh, they were uh, taken good uh, care. And then we find that um, uh, they came back to his house and then on the next day, uh, the uh, 
the magistrates and uh, their surgeons uh, instructing them uh, they should leave the city. And that is the time that Paul raised this matter. How can they secretly uh, ask us to go from here when we were Romans, we are Roman citizens and we were not uh, undergoing trial without undergoing a trial, we were punished in this manner and they should not leave us like this. So the magistrates themselves came to them and requested them to leave. And we find that they went to the house of Lydia where he met other brothers and sisters. And then they went to uh, Philippi, I mean, went to Thessalonica. So this was the ministry. So we find that uh, two households, household of Lydia and household of the jailer, they were saved. And uh, the young girl uh, who was being persecuted by the Holy Spirit, she also was relieved of that. And uh, she definitely, she was one among the believers in Philippi. We find uh, the epistle written to, uh, written to Philippians. Um, and we find that many things that can be correlated with these uh, events. Uh, so this is the ministry that took place at uh, uh, Philippi. And then we come to the ministry at uh, Thessalonica. Um, there in Thessalonica, there he had the uh, privilege of going to the uh, the synagogue. Uh, there were considerable number of uh, Jews, and uh, we find that um, Paul went uh, in three Sabbaths. He went to uh, the uh, synagogue and he preached there, and uh, many believed. Uh, we read about um, devoted Greek women, uh, or we read about um, uh, about. Uh, you know, they are the ones who are originally Greek, but they are following the uh, Jewish beliefs. That's how we can understand about these uh, men and women. So we find that many believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we read the epistle to Thessalonians, we can understand that the majority were actually uh, from the idolatrous background. Uh, there were definitely Jews, uh, but uh, the, the, the majority appears to be from the uh, from the Greek, uh, from the uh, pagan religions. That's what we can understand. So what we find that these Jews, when they found that the uh, apostles are being accepted by the uh, by the pre by the people and uh, they are responding to the gospel, uh, they were jealous of apostles. And what they did is, uh, and when we come to um, verse five, uh, but the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So this is what they did. They decided to persecute these uh, preachers. And uh, Jason was the brother who was accommodating uh, Paul and Silas and uh, uh, so uh, Timothy, so they decided to uh, somehow persecute Jason. And when they searched for these uh, preachers in Jason's house, they could not find. And we find that they dragged him to the rulers and he had to give a pledge uh, that uh, he will not associate with them. And uh, that is how they had to leave the city on a very short notice. But as a result, what happened is they could not teach these believers all the fundamental truths uh, and they paul was paul was very very disturbed by that that these believers whether they will stand firm in the truths now one of the important thing that he taught we can see in verse uh, verse 7 whom jason hath received and these all do contrary to the decrees of caesar saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now, so definitely Paul must have spoken about the kingdom of God. Uh, that must be the reason that they interpreted this against Caesar. And this is the strategy that always people use in order to persecute the uh, evangelist. So now we find that uh, this was one matter which we preached. And we find that uh, probably Paul uh, wrote the first, uh, definitely Paul wrote the first epistle uh, in order to help these believers to be established uh, thoroughly in the scripture and uh, in, the, in, the, in the true doctrine. 
we find that Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica uh, to be there and to teach them and to encourage them. And he was waiting for Timothy to come back. And he is referring to these visits in the first uh, epistle to Thessalonians. When we study the epistle to Thessalonians, we will understand all that. So, that, uh, so soon after Paul left Thessalonica, uh, he wrote the first epistle to Thessalonians. And then uh, afterwards, must be when he was staying at Corinth, that was the time he wrote the second epistle to uh, Thessalonians. Now then, after that, we find that Paul went to Berea. Uh, now, in Berea, there was something very, um, very interesting that is recorded, uh, which is worthwhile for us to follow. Uh, and uh, it is that, um, in verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Uh, this is an honorable and noble character that you not only you listen to the preaching with all readiness of mind. This is one important thing. Uh, the listening should be always with readiness of mind. And not only that, one should search the scripture to know whether what is being preached is true or not. And this habit we all should inculcate, uh, emulate, and it is good for us to have this so that we will be stable and steadfast in the true doctrine. Now, this is something exemplary. We read about the Bereans. We do not read about uh, church at Berea, uh, but we find that uh, these men were uh, noble men and uh, they were diligent in studying the scripture. And then we find that the Jews from Thessalonica, they ensured that the ministry in Berea would not continue. So they instigated the people in uh, Berea and Paul had to very uh, quickly leave from Berea. And then we find that he came to Athens. Now Athens was the cultural capital of, of the world in those days. And there were two major philosophies uh, followed by them. One is Epicureans and the other one is Stoics. Epicureans, they believed that uh, all that matters is to uh, have uh, pleasure in life. And uh, that was their philosophy. And the Stoics, uh, they also did not regard uh, in the eternity. And they were a pantheistic religion. They really believed in many gods. And this was their uh, way of uh, life. And we find that Paul, when, they came to, when he came to uh, Athens, uh, there was a synagogue. He, uh, he preached in the synagogue and also in the marketplace to other people. Uh, we know that in a, uh, a well-cultured and educated society, uh, the violence and the persecution may not, be, uh, may not be something common, but we find that intellectual uh, opposition and arguments are quite common. We find that here, uh, Paul, when he was asked to address the crowd at Areopagus, we find that uh, Areopagus actually is like a Supreme Court uh, where the magistrates would sit uh, and it was on the Mars Hill. And uh, we find that he was given an opportunity to present his arguments before the people in that place. And when he went there, uh, he did not quote anything from the Old Testament, but we find that he picked up a, 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 a poetry statement and on the basis of that, he preached gospel. So this is something that worthy for us to also to follow. When we introduce to the gospel, introduce the gospel to people who are not well versed to the scripture or who may not be, uh, may not be maybe ignorant about the scripture, we should be able to pick up uh, statements and events uh, which are uh, not uh, which are commonly known to people and uh, thinking people who would uh, think about it and talk about it. So this is something that we find uh, the Paul's, Paul's approach uh, with regard to the ministry at, uh, uh, at uh, Athens. We find that in uh, chapter 17, verse 23, uh, when he was speaking at Areopagus, um, for as I pass by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Uh, from the way he presented the gospel to these educated men, uh, we can understand many things as to how we should share the gospel. Uh, we find that uh, he is quoting one of the uh, poets, 
on and um, we read it in um, in verse uh, in verse 27 uh, that they should see god uh, seek the lord if uh, happily they might feel after him and find him uh, though he be not far from every one of us uh, for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring so he is quoting from a well known poet so that he can present the gospel and then he mentions about the lord jesus christ as he is being appointed as a judge uh, in verse 31 because he has appointed a day in which uh, he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men uh, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So he introduced the Lord Jesus Christ and we find that uh, specifically we read about two people who accepted the Lord in verse 34. How be it? certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was uh, Dionysius and uh, the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. But we do not read about an assembly that was established in uh, Athens. And we find as the Lord led, uh, he must have gone to Corinth for continuing his, the, the work in Corinth. And Corinth was actually a very uh, well-known commercial center. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, uh, the immorality was uh, rampant in that place. And in the midst of that, there was a synagogue there. And Paul went and preached the gospel in synagogue. And again, we find the Jews were uh, agitated and they opposed uh, Apostle Paul. Now, in this uh, narration, we find another thing that Priscilla and Aquila uh, joined uh, Apostle Paul. They were actually living in Rome and the Caesar Claudius, he uh, brought out a rule against the Jews that the Jews should leave Rome and thus on the, the uh, Aquilas actually is from Pontus. Pontus is on north of uh, um, Asia Minor, uh, but uh, we find that on the, probably on the way to his hometown, uh, he dropped at um, you know, Corinth and the, he was at Corinth. And they had the same uh, profession of tent making. So we find that we do not know whether Aquila and Priscilla were believers before they met Paul, but anyway, uh, they, they were believers and they were together with Apostle Paul uh, in their profession and also working together in the uh, evangelism. And we find that uh, Paul was staying uh, close to the, uh, the synagogue. And uh, after, the, uh, after the Jews rejected the gospel, we find in chapter 18, verse 5, um, uh, in chapter 18, verse 6, uh, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. Now, dear brothers and sisters, this is something very important for us to notice. Every Christian is a debtor to those whom we come in contact to share the gospel. And here Paul is telling that um, he shook his raiment and said unto them, you are bled upon your own heads. Uh, you know, bearing the responsibility of blood is something very serious. And this is what Paul mentions with regard to Corinthians and also uh, when he preaches in chapter, when he talks to the elders in chapter 20, we find to Ephesians will also, he says the same thing. So believers have a great responsibility to share the gospel uh, and uh, that is uh, obligation uh, with regard to the blood. So therefore it's something very serious. And we find that these Jews, when they rejected the gospel, Paul is telling them that uh, I am, uh, not uh, going to be responsible for your fate. And then uh, near the, uh, the synagogue, there was a Jewish convert. In other words, the, a Greek con who had converted to uh, Judaism and his name was Justus. And we find that he stayed there. And then while staying there, he came in contact with Crispus who was actually the ruler of the synagogue. 
And we find that Crispus and his family, he came to faith. And then we find that later we read about Stephanus and also about Sostenus. So all these believers, they accepted the Lord and came to faith. And one important thing is the Lord encouraged Apostle Paul in verses uh, 9 and 10. Then uh, speak, Lord, speak the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. Now, this was a great encouragement to Paul. We find that Paul continued in Corinth for one and a half years, and he taught them. And after that, what happened is uh, the, uh, the proconsul of uh, Achaia, his name was Gallio. Uh, it seems he was appointed in uh, somewhere in AD 50, 53. So therefore, we get a clear time of the second missionary journey. Second missionary journey must have taken place from uh, AD 50 to AD 53. Now, uh, they, the Jewish people, they, they persuaded uh, Gallio to take action against Paul. And when Paul was brought before Gallio, Paul could not even argue. Before that, Paul dismissed, saying that if there is something related to the, uh, if there is a crime or some such thing, then I can deal with that. That comes under my jurisdiction. If something related to your law, then we wouldn't I wouldn't like to involve in this. And then what happened is uh, Sosthenes uh, was beaten in front of Gallio and uh, tried to probably attract his, att his attention. But we find that uh, Gallio did not bother. And uh, Paul could continue there in Corinth for some more time. And then he decided to go. This is how the ministry at uh, Corinth entered. Um, now, this is, this, is, this is the ministry at Corinth. So these are the uh, five major cities where Paul ministered during his um, uh, second missionary journey. Now we come to some of the questions uh, that would obviously come to our mind. The first question that I would like to consider is, why a dissension between Paul and Barnabas uh, take place? Uh, why did a uh, dissension between Paul and Barnabas take place and who was right? Now, uh, there are various arguments with regard to this uh, by, uh, you know, different uh, people. Uh, but what is interesting for us to note is that uh, God had a purpose in allowing this. Um, we know that uh, we read about Barnabas, that he was a good man. And uh, he, uh, he was the one who introduced Apostle Paul to the apostles and others and encouraged him. And he was a very profitable man. But uh, he, we find that his nephew, John Mark, he was with them when, he, when, when they set out on the first missionary journey. And at Pamphylia, uh, he returned. And that was the reason Paul told that we should not take him along with us. And that was the, uh, the point of argument. And we find that there was a sharp argument and we finally find that they separated. Now, some say that because there is no mention of Barnabas ministry in the records, uh, probably Barnabas was wrong. Um, but we don't have any reason to say that because it's only his ministry is only absent in the records in the scripture. But we find that he went to Cyprus, which was his hometown, and he continued the ministry there along with Mark. And also we find about uh, Barnabas being mentioned by Apostle Paul in the Epistle to Corinthians and to Colossians. So we find that Paul did have appreciation for the ministry of Barnabas. So therefore, uh, there is no reason to uh, think that uh, uh, it was Barnabas was wrong in uh, uh, not going with the uh, with Apostle Paul. And what I would say is this, that uh, there is no right and wrong in this, uh, but what we need to understand is as a result of this dissension, some good things happen. One is that Silas joined with Apostle Paul in the ministry, and Timothy also joined with Apostle Paul in the ministry. And we find that there were two missionary teams now working uh, for the work of, for the glory of the Lord. So therefore, God had a purpose in allowing this and why he did so, we do not know. So we do not have an answer to say who is right and who is wrong, but uh, we know that God had a purpose in permitting this and uh, therefore we, had, we don't have to think that, uh, you know, it was not right to have this kind of a, um, this kind of a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Now, another question that may come to our mind is, um, why did Paul insist on circumcision of Timothy, who objected Titus 
uh, circumcision in Galatians chapter uh, 2. When we turn to Galatians chapter 2 verses 3, 4, and 5, we find that uh, Paul was against circumcising uh, Titus. Uh, I shall just read those verses. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of the false brother Navais brought in, um, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Uh, to whom we gave place, uh, we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, the thing is, here, uh, they were persuading Titus to be circumcised for, as a means of his salvation. And that is what was objectionable to Apostle Paul. But with regard to uh, Timothy, what we read in verses 3 and 4, uh, uh, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father, they knew all uh, that his father was a Greek. Uh, now, uh, here, here the thing is this. We know that Paul's style of ministry was, he will go to a synagogue, preach there for some time, and that is how he approached every city where there was a Jewish synagogue. Now, when he goes with a man who is uncircumcised, and if there is anybody who knows that he's uncircumcised, he will not be even allowed to enter in the synagogue. So therefore, uh, it was for the sake of the Jews that Paul decided that Timothy should be baptized, not uh, should be circumcised, not that it will be a means of salvation. So therefore, we need to understand it was only for the sake of Jews uh, in order to avoid uh, that their prejudice will cause them to uh, stop listening to the gospel. They, he decided to uh, circumcise uh, Timothy. And then uh, now another thing, a question we may come to our mind is, why did the Spirit of Christ forbid them to go to Asia Minor and Bithynia? We know very clearly that God's plan was in the second missionary journey, the gospel should reach uh, Europe. And God directed it in that way. Now the question is, how did the Lord do that? The scripture only says that, um, that now uh, they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, incidentally, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, we read about Paul and Silas being commended by the church for the ministry and sent to uh, Cilicia. Uh, but with regard to Barnabas and Mark, we do not precisely read that they were commended. But it doesn't mean that Paul and Barnum, uh, Silas only were commended and Barnabas and Mark were not commended. Both were commended and both, uh, both teams were encouraged. And that's what we can assume from the way uh, the work uh, goes on. Uh, no, okay. Now, uh, back to uh, this uh, matter. And then in verse 7, we read, um, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. In all probability, what we can think is, there must have been a circumstance because of which they cannot travel to Bithynia and they cannot travel to Phrygia. This is all that we can think of. Maybe a natural calamity or maybe... Um, um, some other uh, riot or some such ob obstruction because of which they were not able to go. This is what we can assume. And uh, persistent opposition, they must have recognized that this is from the Holy Spirit and therefore we need not pursue in that direction. This is what we can, uh, we can conclude uh, from the brief narration that we see in the scripture. And now another question that might come to our mind is, uh, the girl who was pro pro proclaiming, these men are born servants of Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. In fact, what this demon-possessed girl was proclaiming was truth. And why did Apostle Paul uh, object and uh, heal her out of this, uh, this, uh, dem uh, this evil spirit? This is a question that uh, might come to her because what she was proclaiming was truth and it was everybody uh, listening to this truth. Now, the thing is this. There are two things. One is this uh, evil spirit was actually uh, troubling and um, uh, persecuting this uh, girl. And that was truly a troublesome thing. That was something that grieving Apostle Paul. Uh, 
Uh, though she was saying this, she was being uh, being uh, troubled by this uh, evil spirit. So therefore, uh, that was one, one matter of concern. Paul wondered had to be relieved from that. And the second thing is, though the testimony what she said, uh, what this evil spirit uh, spoke through her was true, the Lord does not want the testimony of a devil uh, about a truth. So therefore, uh, it is very important not only the, 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 the fact of the matter, but also the person who testifies it. So this is an instruction for us that when we testify about our Lord, we should be people who are worthy to testify of our Lord. With our practical life and with all areas of our life, we should be people who are worthy to testify of our blessed Lord. So these are the two things that we can see uh, from this uh, incident. So the Lord is not uh, delighted by the testimony of those who do not live according to the testimony that they give and the standard that the Lord expects from them. So this is another thing we can uh, learn from this uh, event. And then another question that we may find is, um, why did the preachers land in jail for no fault of theirs? Um, now, uh, you know, why did the Lord allow that? Uh, the purpose, we do not know. God, in his, in his sovereign wisdom, he does things which are, you know, impossible for us to understand what was the logic behind that. We can see a few things. One is, if they would not have been arrested and put in jail, probably the jailer would not have had an opportunity uh, to listen to the gospel. So uh, that, that is one a good outcome uh, of this event uh, of persecution of these um, uh, preachers. Another thing what we find is, it is something unknown to the world that when people pass through persecution, they can praise God. But we find that um, uh, in the life of uh, Apostle Paul and Silas, this was proved to the prisoners that yes, the people who are being persecuted unjustly, not for their any, any, any fault of theirs, they can rejoice and sing. And this was a testimony to the world and recorded in the scripture that this happened in the Philippian jail. So this was uh, two things which happened as a result of this persecution. As I told earlier, God does things which are much beyond our understanding. And he does in a sovereign purpose. And we, has, we have no reason to ask why did, why did the Lord allow that? And he does for the glory of his name. And then another uh, question that can uh, come to our mind is, this is an argument that is put forward by people. Uh, we read about the jailer that he and his household was saved. So uh, whether uh, if the head of the family believe whether the household will uh, be saved. This is a question that people can pose. Now, thing is, the scripture is very clear. There are numerous verses which says that salvation is personal. And this verse should be understood in such a way that as you believe, if your household also, also believe, they also will be saved. This is how we should understand from this because scripture is consistent all throughout. There are no contradictions. So therefore, we need to understand and interpret every verse in the light of the whole scripture. So therefore, uh, definitely by, by the faith of the head of the family, the household will not be saved. And then another question, another you know, argument that is put forth by those who are uh, baptizing infants is that when the household of Lydia and household of the jailer was uh, baptized, we were baptized, uh, the, there must have been some infants and infants also must have been baptized. Now, again, uh, the truth is this, that there is no record to say this. There is no record to say that is one thing. And another thing, the whole scripture very clearly says that only those who have believed should be baptized and they alone were baptized. So contrary to this clear instruction in the scripture, how can anybody argue that there would have been some children and they also would have been baptized? So therefore, it is a baseless argument and uh, there is no reason to think that um, uh, one can establish a doctrine on such faulty uh, arguments. And then another question uh, that comes to our mind is, uh, should the believers claim their rights? Now, it was Paul's right 
to uh, claim a trial or demand a trial uh, before he was being beaten uh, in front of the magistrate. He would have only, he had to shout that we are Roman citizens. That's all that he had to uh, say, but he did not say that. What, what was, what, was it right for him to claim the, uh, in fact, it is like this. Uh, those who have any such rights, they can claim it and uh, it should be done in such a way that it will not be an obstruction to the preaching of the gospel. In case of Paul, on the previous day, he did not claim this right. But on the next day, we find that he claimed this, this right. So therefore, we find that we should be wisely done in such a way that it will be for the glory of God and for the promotion of the, uh, of the gospel. And then um, there could be other questions coming to mind. I'll just uh, mention one more question. Um, we find that uh, in um, uh, chapter 18, verse 22, I think, we read that uh, Paul uh, is saying that he had to go to Senkraya uh, to cut his hair. Now, what must be the context of this? How can we think that Paul would think of, uh, you know, making a vow like this, that he will cut his hair at Senkraya? Now, in all probability, uh, we need to understand one thing. In the book of Acts, the transition from the uh, practice of the Jews are gradually uh, changing into uh, the, uh, the uh, sound uh, Christian doctrines and practices. Now, during this time, in all probability, what we can think is a person who has a deeper commitment and uh, affection to the Lord, they express it by their vows. Now, we know that the Nazarite vow is something which was voluntarily being done by uh, people. And now, Paul being a Jew, uh, he knew that God saved his life in all these situations. And uh, even in front of Gallio, he had a miraculous escape. So as a gratitude and as a Jew, he must have thought it is good to observe a Nazarite vow. Now, the Nazarite vow requires 30 days, 60 days, 100 days to be, uh, you know, abstaining from anything that is uh, that is uh, coming out of wine and also grape and also uh, from other, other disciplinary things, uh, a total separation. Now, uh, we know that he grew his hair during that season. So cutting of hair was one of the uh, requirements in the Nazarite vow. So we can think that probably he had made a Nazarite vow, and that's what he wanted to fulfill. Now, with regard to believers, we do not, uh, we are not obligated to observe any, make any vow and uh, observe any vow. But once, uh, uh, make any vow. But if we make a vow, we should fulfill that vow. We should take it seriously. But it is, it is, uh, it is actually uh, voluntarily. If one wants to make a vow one can make, but there is no obligation on any believers to make any vow. For instance, people who follow the Lenten, these are things which are unscriptural and there is no any base in the scripture for making any kind of fasting or any kind of vows uh, and it is not obligatory. But we do not find that it is wrong to make a vow, but it is important uh, and it is uh, necessary that if one makes a vow, it, is, it should be fulfilled as he has uh, made it. So this is very important because uh, if one makes a vow, it is being made in front of God. And with that seriousness and commitment, one, one should fulfill it. This is what we can understand uh, with regard to this. So, but Paul, uh, in all probability, he was uh, trying to uh, fulfill that vow which he made as a person who practiced the uh, Jewish religion. Uh, may God help us that the lessons that we learn from this will be able to put into practice and also uh, that we will live committed uh, life.